Hello, this is Vince and I'm talking about the MIT Sloan School of Management cover letter. I'm an admissions consultant and advisor, been working for 10 years helping people apply to top graduate and MBA programs, including MIT. Uh, the cover letter for MIT is like this. The question says, prepare a cover letter up to 500 words seeking a place in the MIT Sloan MBA program. The cover letter should describe your accomplishments, address any extenuating circumstances that may apply to your application, and conform to standard business correspondence. Your letter should be addressed to Rod Garcia, Senior Director of Admissions. All right, what does it mean? Um, the question behind the question here, I think, is absolutely the first one, can you get a job? MIT Sloan doesn't uh, ask for a goal essay but they very much care about job placement. When I met the Dean, uh, when I met Dean Schmidtlin uh, in Tokyo, he was very proud of the fact that, and I don't have the exact statistics, that MIT has a very high, has a, a high placement rate, not only in consulting and, and iBanking finance, but also in operational companies, Amazon, Google, et cetera. Um, so M MIT very much cares that you'll have a good internship and get a great job when you graduate. That's that's their value proposition. That's how they justify um, the expense of the, of the program, and, and that's how they compete with other schools. They absolutely care about you getting a job. They just don't want you to write an essay about it because, as they say, and I agree, um, pe people figure out what people just say what they think the admissions office wants to hear. The, the goals essay can sometimes just be a formula. Um, MIT doesn't necessarily want you to write about your short and long-term goals in a traditional way that Stanford or Columbia do, um, or Wharton does, but they absolutely want to confirm that you actually have the skills to uh, have a good job when you graduate from and with your MBA. So getting a job, um, to get a job and also to get into MIT, you have to differentiate yourself. In the MIT cover letter, the minimum that you have to do, which I'll call good, um, is you, you at least have to explain any negative situations that um, you faced. And you have to do it for your cover letter because you have to do it for job uh, interviews. Recruiters notice and they ask about grade, grades and GMAT scores and um, they want to know why you weren't working, you know, why you have a gap in your employment or something like that. So if, if any of those issues apply to you, you need to explain them in the cover letter because um, you're going to need to explain them to a recruiter, and that's why it matters. Um, beyond that, it'd be nice to differentiate yourself with, with one of these uh, qualifying adjectives like first, youngest, only, or best, um, to actually show, this, this should be in your resume as well, but in the cover letter you can highlight things that you've done where you were the youngest one uh, promoted or something, or the, you're the only one who's performing a certain function in your team or your office or your company or whatever, um, or best that you have some awards or some rec external recognition for the work that you do. So first, youngest, only, or best, those are good terms in, in resumes, in reference letters, um, everywhere, basically, uh, and cover letters too. And, and the best way to differentiate yourself, and this is the hardest way, so I nobody does it, or most people can't do it, or most cover letter drafts I see don't even have anything anywhere close to this, is something actually like a, a unifying theme. Um, we very much like Stanford's uh, What Matters Most, that's my little abbreviation here, What Matters Most to You and Why. Um, it's very much like, like that, where you're actually identifying something you do um, you're actually identifying a unifying concept or a theme or a value that says who you really are. A cover letter with that kind of thing absolutely differentiates itself because, again, it's very, very rare for someone to have that high level of self-awareness where they can actually synthesize and present a hypothesis about who they are. Uh, if you watch my Stanford video, which you might want to do, if you even if you haven't or won't apply to Stanford, it could help you with this part of your cover letter. 
is to, in, in my case, the key word would be community, and I would talk in my cover letter. I'm, look, I'm not saying copy and paste Stanford Essay 1. Cover letter of MIT and the Essay 1 of Stanford are different questions, fundamentally. But the logic could, could be the same. If you, if, if you were successful and happy with your Stanford answer, if you think it really captured uh, what really matters to you, then that theme could be included in the cover letter as well, because that kind of differentiation is is precious because it doesn't exist in the resume, certainly or the re reference letters, the recommendation letters, and probably not in essay one or essay two either. It's nowhere else in your application. It's only in this cover letter where you tell us, like I would tell you, everything I've ever done in my life has been about creating community. I've, I've had different roles and titles of teacher, actor, musician, or admissions counselor, admissions advisor, um, consultant, coach, whatever I call myself. It, what I do is always the same thing. It's all about creating community. The, the tools I use may be different, but everything I've ever done and everything I want to do in the future, including at MIT, has to do with this concept of creating community and what, and what that means to me. This would be part of my MIT cover letter as well. This would unify the examples and other stuff that I would talk about in my cover letter, and that's really hard to do. Um, but if you can do it, you should try. Okay. Quick pause for my favorite tea here. The second question behind the question. Do you share our culture? Um, my assumption is that you know our culture, our being MIT. I'm speaking as if I'm MIT. I'm obviously not. You know our MIT culture if you know our people. Culture is pretty much people. A sociologist might argue with me, but... People are a big part of culture. You don't think you can have one without the other, in my view, anyway. Not at an MBA program. So if you know our people, um, you can show it a good way, a simple way. Maybe the minimal way is just some names. I talk to these MIT graduates or these current students. Um, a better way is to actually talk about transformative conversations that you've had where your knowledge of the school transformed. You, you, you learned new information. You had an idea and you got clarification or confirmation or ex expanding. Uh, that's not the right part of speech. You expanded the idea that you had somehow or deepened it. You learned new things about the school that confirmed your cultural fit, your, your feeling of belonging. This is the place for you. The best way, and again, not everyone has it, and I don't suggest you fake this because they can find out. Uh, don't make this up. But if you do have such a story, absolutely share this kind of a story, would be to say like this. Um, you know, my friend Sue went to MIT. I've known her all my life and followed her, you know, career. And, and she's someone I grew up next door. Our parents are friends. Anyway, whatever. Someone I respect, someone I know, before, during, and after MIT. And I see how the school changed her. And that's the transformation that I want as well. Either she's used the school to transition her career in a way that I want to transition mine, or I see how the school has changed her into a certain kind of leader uh, or team member or whatever. It's, it's transformed her character or built her skills in some important way. Anyway... The experience that Sue had is very much like the experience that I want out of an MBA, and I know MIT is the place for me because it, this is someone with whom I have a deep connection and I see what the school did for them and I want to have that same experience. That's real if you've got it, and if you don't, don't try. But if you've got that, you may have that for one or two of the schools on your list. If MIT is one of them, put that in your cover letter. Okay, third question behind the question. MIT, Sloan Admissions Office, has to ask itself at some point, will this person attend if we admit them? Look at the numbers. Harvard's yield is number one. Stanford's is number two. Columbia is number three. Wharton and then MIT's fifth. Fifth out of five. These are the top five schools in terms of yield. And let me just remind you in case, um, in case it's, it's uh, not clear... Yield basically means 
Um, of those, so not, let's use Harvard as an example. It's the, it's the most famous one, and it's the one everyone else is jealous of, I'm sure. Harvard admits however many people. Um, of those people, 90% say yes to Harvard. So Harvard says yes to X people. I should have memorized that number. I didn't. I'm not going to make it up. Harvard admits X number of people. 90% of X says, thanks, Harvard. Here's my deposit. See you in the fall or in the summer. Um, that's an enviable statistic, right? No other school comes close um, except Stanford and then quite a bit down in the 70% range, Columbia. Columbia is 72% because of early decision round. I think that's, no one's ever said that. I just kind of figured that out. Um, Wharton's just behind there. And then, if, you know, in the mid-60s and wanting to be higher and probably now is higher, um, because of the the thing last year where they over they over admitted, I think they were expecting about sixty five percent yield, and they got surprised. They're they're hot or whatever. Um, more people who who they offered uh, seats to took those seats, so there aren't enough seats. Anyway, still not number four. I don't think no matter what, I don't think they're going to beat Wharton this year. They're trying to, um, uh, they want to, and whatever. More power to them if they can. Anyway. This is why this question is, re is a real question. And so how, are, how do you address this issue? And let me, let me share a, an anecdote. It actually relates to a client of mine who was admitted to Wharton and MIT and a bunch of other schools um, and went to Wharton. This is someone who's all his life assumed he would go to MIT, given his background or where he works or something about his, you know, personality or something is the kind of guy who as a kid maybe dreamed of MIT as soon as he heard about the school it was like the school he wanted to go to maybe for engineering or undergrad or something but anyway still in his mind for MBA he's held out this hope well when he starts the process MIT is number one on his list but then along the way he meets some Wharton people and he thinks what well, that's a neat school for whatever reason it takes him where he wants to go for whatever reason he gets into MIT he gets into Wharton in round one he saves his MIT application for round two, for whatever reason. Um, he goes to the Wharton Admitted Students Weekend. He flies back, and the next morning he has his MIT admissions interview. And Wharton uh, and MIT, which is famous and the first school to have uh, to use behavioral interview questions, at this admissions interview, the interviewer, the admissions staff person, didn't ask a single behavioral question, right? So I'm helping this client prepare for the interview. We're doing all these behavioral questions. He gets to the real interview, and there's not a single behavioral question asked. The only questions asked are in five different ways with lots of follow-up. Tell me again why you really want to come to MIT. It, you know, it's, it, it's like, you know, these MIT admissions officers, all admissions officers, veterans are smart, and they're perceptive, and they have intuition. It's like this. It's like this. It's like the guy was, you know, it's like underneath he could feel this Wharton. I just happened to be wearing this shirt today. Um, my client, different client sent me this when he got admitted to Wharton, and I wear it sometimes just because it's fun. I didn't go to Wharton anyway. I happened to be wearing this shirt, so I thought it'd be fun to flash you in my video. Um, it's, it was like that. It's like x-ray vision, the interviewer can just kind of like, it's like he smelled, this guy smelled like cheesesteak or something, right? He, he had this Philly vibe. Somehow, you know, Wharton didn't come up in the interview, but it's like the MIT interviewer was sitting there skeptically saying, you know, God, if, we, if we take this guy, is he going to come? Is he going to come? And they ask that. So at the any admissions interview, they ask what they want to ask is my point here. I'm not saying, don't, I'm going to get in trouble again. I'm not saying don't prepare for behavioral questions. It's the standard MIT interview f uh, formula. So don't skip it. I'm just saying that if they throw it out, if something else you know, crops up in this case, um, tell me again, how many MIT people do you know? And, you know, how much time have you spent, you know, tell me, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you testing and checking and probing? Because again, this number, Wharton beats MIT statistically. So chances are, numbers suggest that if somebody's admitted to both school, they might go to Wharton and, and MIT doesn't like that. So they want to confirm it. So how do you, how do you address this in your cover letter? Well, um, various ways. Um, one way is just to simply say it. MIT is my dream school and if admitted I'll attend. You could write that or you could say it in the interview. I, I don't always suggest it but you could. Another way, a better way, is to actually prove it. Again with these qualifiers or only or best. So only MIT has this thing that I need. 
It could be a professor, a, 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 a research center, um, a, a, some opportunity, some program. It could be a, a, a cross-disciplinary tie-up that MIT has with another department, you know, that, that Sloan has with another part of MIT or with the Kennedy School or whatever. It, it, something at MIT is exactly what you need um, to fulfill yourself. Um, and the best way of all is to tie it back to this theme. So again, if I'm Mr. Community, this is a hard one, by the way, to sell, but I'd have to s somehow say that since I'm the community guy who makes community, creates community, somehow MIT gives me the missing piece. You know, I don't know what this logic would be because I'm not applying to MIT. I haven't really thought this through, but it would be like, you know, the communities I need to create now, are there's some missing piece. I want to create a new form of community, um, and, and only MIT has some element, uh, some aspect of the school, either the experience of being there for two years and or some person I would study with or some um, program that I would take advantage of or some resor research or resources that I would tap into um, is the missing piece for the new form of community that I am going to create. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just making, like, I'm going to make the next Facebook or something, whatever. I'm not. Um, and, and again, MIT doesn't want to know your goal per se, so I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here. My point, though, is that if you can prove that the school connects to you at the deepest level, um, that would prove to, to them that there'd be something that only they offer, and that would prove to them that you will be highly likely to beat the statistic and actually choose MIT over some other school that's ranked higher. I mean, maybe you didn't even apply to any of those other schools that are have a higher yield. It's MIT and schools with a lower yield or whatever. You, I'm not saying name the names of other schools um, in your cover letter or maybe even at your interview. If they ask, you have to say where else you've applied. I think it's a fair question and it should be answered honestly. But then, again, you've got to come back to this but MIT beats them all because of whatever it is, this killer thing that only MIT has. So figure this logic out. Um, all right, I'm going to sign off here and keep this one short. I have to apologize as well. This, I meant to make this video much earlier than I'm actually making it. I've been very busy with, uh, my, with my main responsibility, which is helping my clients meet deadlines. And so this video is just squeaking in. Um, before round one. I hope you watch it and have time to think about the stuff I'm saying here and apply it in some way, uh, whether you're applying round one, round two, whenever you're applying to MIT. Um, best of luck and thanks for watching and um, stay tuned. I'll be making more of these whenever I can. All right, thanks again. Good luck to you. Bye-bye.